<clears throat> so what we got going on here is we've got uh, for APDC psychology, this is unit four, lecture eight. And for on level psychology, this is unit one, lecture six, where we're talking about motivation and a little bit of an intro to motivation, if you would. Uh, this is uh, sort of what gets us going. It's got a little bit of a, it gets us going a little bit of movement and things like that. We're going to talk about homeostasis. We're going to talk about what is a drive versus what is an incentive. And then finally, we're going to talk about Maslow's hierarchy and this idea that we're going to try to get up to, uh, we're going to try to get up to um, what's called self-actualization. Kind of blurry there. I'm going to do this. And I'll refocus. There we go. Uh, so I'll refocus that for you. Little tricks I'm beginning to learn here from the hovercraft. So let's take a look at motivation. Uh, what is it? It's internal. It's an internal state. It's within you. And it's sort of what gets us going, what guides our behavior uh, towards a certain goal. And again, just like stress, uh, all of our motivation is a little bit different. Uh, what motivates you may not necessarily motivate somebody else. Uh, so when we look at what motivates you, a lot of you guys would say school, a lot of you guys would say friends, a lot of you guys would say love, a lot of you guys would say sports, a lot of you guys would say I get in shape, uh, a lot of you guys would say my parents. You know, there's a lot of different things that can motivate you. Uh, some of the motivations are biological, you know, things that I, that I physically need, hunger, thirst, now, sex, and we're going to talk about this when we talk about Maslow's hierarchy. Sex is not necessarily a motive. Uh, if you've got a four-year-old, they're not driven by sex, although Freud would disagree. Uh, but, uh, and then some people are more motivated by that than others. Uh, temperature, I don't want to be too hot, I don't want to be too cold. Uh, going to the bathroom, if i got to go to the bathroom, I don't know if are off. Uh, sleep, I just want to get some sleep. Uh, I want to be active, I, 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 aggression, I want vengeance. All of those are biological motives. Uh, but then there's also social motives. I want to achieve. I want to win. I, I want to be around a certain group. I want to be invited. I want to be asked out. Uh, I want to be left alone. Autonomy. Uh, nurturance. Uh, I, want, I want others to take care of me. I, I want dominance. I, want, I need to influence. I need to control other things. I need to be king of the mountain. Uh, I want to show off. Uh, I want order. I want things to be right. And, and uh, sometimes play. I just want to have fun. I just want to have a good time. If we do this, then we can have a good time. Sometimes that can be your motivation as well. So again, this is difficult to observe directly. Uh, so it's it takes, uh, when we're studying motivation, we're looking at a couple of levels. There's a lot of things involved. Now, when we get to instinct, uh, instinct is something that you're born with. It's, it's, it's within you, and you're going to be able to do it anyways without any sort of guidance or, or necessarily learning from others. Uh, it's just a, a, a characteristic that you're born that you're going to evolve eventually on your own. Uh, salmon swimming upstream, bears hibernating, birds migrating, nest building, all these things. Uh, animals are sort of born with uh, these particular instincts. Uh, and since they're born with these instincts and these instincts are inherent to them, it makes them not very adaptable to things outside their natural habitat. You take a gorilla and you put him in Antarctica, uh, he's going to struggle. You take a polar bear, you put him in the Amazon rainforest, they're going to struggle because their natural instincts are not necessarily going to take care of them. Uh, humans don't have a lot of instincts. Most of our behavior is learned. My ability to speak is learned. My ability to stress is learned. Is that snake dangerous or not? Uh, so a lot of times when we're talking about uh, human instincts and human nature, we're talking about um, things that are pretty shared in common, but it's more intuition. It's what we learn, and as a result, we can make uh, quick uh, decisions based on previous learning. So most of our behavior is learned. We don't have a lot of instincts. And I know people will go a mother's instinct or a father's instinct or a human instinct. Not really, because if there was truly a, 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 a mothering instinct, that, that means all women would make great mothers. Not the case. All men are not necessarily going to be great fathers. So we tend to learn things more than they are instinctual. 
And what we're learning or what we want to get, what we're looking for is we're learning ways that we can achieve what is called homeostasis. And homeostasis is a balance. I want a balance in my life. I don't want to be too excited, but I don't want to be bored. I don't want to be I don't want to be thirsty, but I don't want to be overwhelmed with fluid. I, I don't want to be hungry, but I also don't want to be full. I want to find that happy place right in the middle. And we look for that for physical things. We look at for emotional things as well. I mean, you don't want to be obsessed with love, but you also don't want to be extremely lonely. Uh, so we're trying to find the in-between of that. So homeostasis is balancing our needs with our achievements. And a need is a biological or psychological requirement that we must have. Some of these needs are physiological. I've got to breathe. I've got to eat. It's not negotiable. And some of them are psychological. I want others to like me. I want to be, uh, I want love. I want to be, I want to love other things. And again, the psychological things we don't necessarily need to survive. The physiological, we got to have. Uh, and we'll talk about that with Maslow, the physiological needs at the bottom. We, those are non-negotiable. And these things produce drives. And a drive is that internal gnawing at you, that state that changes over time that motivates us towards a particular thing. For example, hunger would drive us to eat, curiosity would drive us to learn, and fatigue would drive us to want to go to sleep, and love drives us to do many, many, many stupid things. All right, so these are all things that are driving us so that we can get that balance, I can get that love, I can get that rest, I can get that learning, and I can get that hunger all taken care of. So what we're looking to do ultimately is reduce our drives. And this is what's called drive reduction theory. And it's a really easy theory to learn. I am driven to reduce my wants. Whatever my wants is, it gives me sort of a tension state and I'm going to drive until that is taken care of. If I have hunger, I'm going to be pushed to go downstairs and look for food. Okay. So, and so when I'm tired and when I'm hungry, I'm, I'm agitated, I'm irritable, I'm not a fun person to be around uh, because my needs are not taken care of. So sometimes I just need a, a cookie. I just need a cracker. I just need something that's going to take care of this need and give me my balance in my homeostasis. So I want that balance. And again, some uh, some of the needs that I have are primary needs. I have to have them. I got to have, I got to drink. I have to eat, have to sleep, have to breathe. And some of them are secondary where we learn them. You know, I, I like to watch this show. I like to laugh. I don't have to, but I like to. And some of our behaviors just simply can't be explained. <clears throat> so Clark Hall uh, came up with what is known as the drive reduction theory. And again, the drive reduction theory is that when we're feeling tension, we're driven by that particular thing. And then once we take care of it, we get homeostasis. So everything we're doing, we're trying to reduce a particular drive. Uh, and then what we do is we do random activities until we find something that works or somebody teaches us something that works. Uh, you know, when we eat, uh, we find the food that's good, the food that's satisfying, and then we continue to eat that food because we know it's good, we know it's satisfying. Uh, I'm convinced every food on earth you've started on a dare uh, because somebody had to be the first one to go, well, if you go over to that cow and pull that, I dare you to drink it. Uh, then, you know, we found it was nutritious. So um, food, water, rest, whatever, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna try to find a way to satisfy that. And then once we satisfy it, we're going to repeat that behavior. For example, if you have a headache, what do you do if you have a headache? Some people will take an Advil, some people will take two Tylenol, some people will rest, some people will take a shower, some people put a cold rag on their head, whatever. But once you find what works, you repeat that behavior because why would I do something else? If you're having trouble getting to sleep, some of us may have, I'm going to listen to the oceans on my phone, I'm going to watch a show that I've seen many times, I'm going to count backwards from a million, I'm going to do whatever, and then eventually that works. Uh, how do you study for a test? You know, a question that students will ask me all the time. How do I study for your test? I don't know. You got to find what works for you. Are you a uh, are you a go back and look at the notes person? Are you a read the textbook person? Are you a uh, I got to write them all out sort of a question? Are you a flashcard person? You got to find what works for you, and then once you find what works for you, you repeat that behavior. 
So again, we're always looking to reduce these drives and then we get a learned behavior, a community response, we get that homeostasis and once it's gone, we get the need again, we're driven and we do it and it just becomes a cyclical thing. And this is what we've done all our lives from acquiring property to seeking thrills, you know, go on that roller coaster and then that satisfies me. But I need to go on the bigger roller coaster because I need more of a satisfaction. And you get this with some thrill seekers, you know, the person who uh, starts jumping off the bed, then he jumps off the cliff, then he jumps out of a plane because he needs more of a rush because the bed's not giving him the same thing anymore. So we develop this need and we get this need for social approval. Uh, because we, we, we learn very early uh, to care for others, like a little baby here. You know, babies are kind of worthless. They don't do anything. Uh, but we love them because they provide these cute eyes and this cute face and everything else, and we want them to like us. So we do things for them. Uh, and then they realize that if they show us the cute face and the cute reactions, they get what they want. And it becomes a learned drive. If I'm cute and I'm on nice and if I'm good, I get rewarded. If I'm bad, I get punished. So this is learned behavior sort of drives us to do better, good things, hopefully. Uh, now, again, Hull overlooked the idea of wants and choices and levels of wants as well uh, and needs as well. Uh, you know, we'll talk about this down the road when we look at all those monkeys. Uh, that infants who wanted attachment had other things where they, they needed the food, but they also wanted the attachment from the mothers, the love from the mothers. Some experiences are inherently pleasurable, and that will drive us to do uh, certain things. We like soft things. We like cuddling. We like those. We don't have to have them, but we like to have them. And then some people will put that above their needs. They'll put their wants above their needs, uh, which can screw things up a little bit. So it really comes down to how important is that incentive to you? An incentive is, is a reinforcer or a reward that motivates you to do a particular thing. Okay, so a drive is something that is causing you to react and the incentive is gonna pull you towards it. So sometimes if I've already got a strong drive, I don't need that great of an incentive because my drive is already strong. Because if I'm really, really thirsty, I mean, I'm really just unbelievable uh, thirsty. I'm just so, so thirsty water is going to taste amazing because I'm so thirsty because I have such a need. So since I have such a need and a strong drive, I don't need that great of an incentive. When I'm really, really hungry, cafeteria food may taste amazing because I'm so, so hungry. And if you're really lonely or heartbroken, you, you're not looking for Mr. Right, you're looking for Mr. All Right for now. You just need someone. And this is why a lot of people are told when you get out of a relationship, just be by yourself for a while to sort of settle that need and realize that you're gonna need yourself and whatnot. Now on the other side of the equation is let's say your, 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 your drive is low uh, because you don't necessarily want something, but if the incentive is so great, now suddenly you want it. For example, uh, if you just ate and you're not hungry, but I suddenly offered you free pizza, you would probably eat it because it's free. And even though you're not hungry, you're now driven to eat. This is what advertising and TV commercials are all about. They're telling you, you need it. You must have it. The commercial, one time only, limited time, this weekend only, sale, 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 buy one, get one, you know, all these things. And, and you come back, look at how much I saved and, that, and that, that, that need to save and that need to get a deal and all these other things can sometimes make up for that want not being that great. You know, when I see people on uh, tax-free weekend in August, and they're like, oh, we went on this tax-free weekend, and, 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 and then the malls are crowded. You don't need to be there to save 8.5%, you know, but the idea of I got to get a deal, I got I to gotta, I gotta get the best price. And then sometimes if we don't get the best price, we're really upset. You know, you get a brand new pair of headphones, earbuds, whatever, and you get them for a certain amount of money, and you, you like them, and you're pretty happy, and then you find out next week they're on sale for cheaper, and sometimes you don't like them. So, so that's strong, if it's a great incentive, even if I don't need it, I'll get it because my incentive is so, so strong. You know, when you go to the grocery store, the milk and the bread, they're located in the back. And meanwhile, they're gonna to try to get you with a buy one, get one. You know, if you'll notice during the whole height of COVID when stores weren't open that long, especially grocery stores, HEB Kroger, they didn't have anything on sale. They didn't have any specials because people were just buying up toilet paper. And there's another, sort of a thing where <laughs> the idea of, of I gotta have to, no you don't, but since everybody's, since there's so little of it, I feel like I need it. 
even though you know I've got plenty of toilet paper at home, the fact that it's so so scarce, I must buy some now too. And now people have an overload of toilet paper, uh, and again, impulse buys by by the checkout. You, you don't want to go you don't want to go to the grocery store hungry because if you're hungry now you've got a strong drive and you're going to buy stuff that you don't necessarily need to buy. Uh, so other stuff there on how advertising affects us psychologically. Uh, changes our memories, colors are important, and all those other things. Uh, and by the way, you can go to college and just major on psychology and advertising. Now, again, as we talked about before, when we talked about stress, can money buy happiness to some degree? Yes, it can. You can see these people are happier and happier and happier. But once you get this much, again, it's diminishing return because we buy the bigger home, we buy the bigger car, we buy the bigger whatever, and we think it's going to give us satisfaction when it really it only gives us bigger bills. So to some degree, the answer is no, because once I've got a significant amount of things, I'm responsible for my dissatisfaction. I don't have that scapegoat to blame other things. So although we want balance in our life and we want that homeostasis, we also like that temporary rush and the stimulation, because again, when we when we when we talk about stimulation that we don't want, we call we call it we call it stress. Uh, but when we talk about stimulation that we do want, we call that excitement. You know, you take a look at people who watch scary movies, which I don't understand. Why you would want to watch a movie and be scared? But some people want that because they want the stimulation. They want to go on the roller coaster. They want to jump off the mountain. They want to jump out of the airplane with a snowboard. Are you insane? But they want to do that because just jumping out of an airplane wasn't enough. Now I need to latch a snowboard because because the, it was giving me a rush jumping out of a plane. It's like, OK, not a big deal. Snowboard. Let's try that without a parachute. Uh, and because you become a little bit numb to that. And again, that's one of the problems with thrill seekers is you got to go the next thing, the next thing, the next thing and the next thing. And again, all of these are frightening, but there is a sense of safety to it. You know, I know on the roller coaster I'm strapped in and everybody else survives. I know in the scary movie, I like to see the scariness and I know I'm going to survive. At least I think I am. I don't think anyone's going to break in here. I don't want to be pissed off. But, you know, odds are you're going to survive the movie and all these particular things. So sometimes we want to take on these stressful things. But even though they seem dangerous, in reality, they are uh, when it comes to arousal theory, there's this thing called the yerk dobson Law of Optimal Arousal, which is right here in the middle. The, thing, the fact of the matter is we're going to do some things in our life that are very, very stressful. And we're going to do some things in our life that, that don't really have a lot of stress. And then sometimes the things that happen where we don't have a lot of stress, we end up screwing them up because we make simple mistakes and vice versa. Uh, for example, uh, I would, if you are asked to do a math problem and you don't know how to do it, and the teacher asks you to go up and all the kids are going, you can't do it. That distraction is not going to help you. But at the same time, if you're good and everybody's being quiet, you're more likely to make a mistake. Example, I used to coach basketball. And, and uh, when I did, I would have my players come out and say, all right, let's go layup drill. And these guys after school, they would just miss layups all the time because it was simple. They didn't care. Yet these same guys, it's Friday night and everybody's filled up to the rafters at the gym. And it's like, dan, dan, the music going, dan, 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 dan. They, it's a slam dunk competition because now they're doing it in front of other people. So sometimes when the task is very, very simple, we need our arousal level to be high in order for the performance to be high because we need to have more of a focus. We need to get excited. You need to clap your hands, whatever. Let's, let's go. Let's, you know, you need your excitement level up for this simple task. Yet a difficult task, we want our excitement level to be low. If you've ever had to put in contact, you take your finger and go right to your, you know, right to your eyeball. That's not good. You know, you, you don't want somebody next to you going, put it in, put it in, but you don't want that. You want to be able to focus on touching your eyeball. <laughs> so you want silence. So again, when something is difficult, doing a math problem in front of others, whatever, I need my arousal level to be low in order for my performance to be high. Again, when I did stand up. I'd want a bigger crowd so that I would have a higher level of arousal, better performance. Now, most days, we're not doing just simple tasks or difficult tasks. Sometimes I'm walking, very simple. Uh, talking to other people, very simple. Uh, yet, uh, having to figure out our plans for the weekend may be a little bit more difficult. So I'm going to be, I'm gonna be uh, rotating between very simple tasks 
and very difficult tasks. So I don't want my arousal level to be too high. I don't want it to be too low. So what I want it right here in the middle. And this is what's referred to as the optimal arousal level. Not too high, not too low. Or I guess that would be too high or too low. And this should help my performance overall. All right, this is referred to as the Yerkes Dobson's Law of Optimal Arousal. I don't want to be too high and I don't want to be too low because I'm going to be rotating between easy tasks and difficult tasks in a given day. Um, other things on fear. Now, uh, humanistic psychology, which we'll get into more down the road, is the idea of you just want to be the best you you can be. That's what humanistic psychology is. Can you be the best you that you can be? We all want to be competent. We all want to be loved. We want to be appreciated by others. I may not be, uh, I may not never be an astronaut, but can I, I'm going to be a teacher. Can I be the, the best teacher that I can be? And again, I may not be as good as somebody down the hall, but am I doing the most that I can with me? That's the idea of humanistic psychology. So you must achieve the lowest level and then work your way up this pyramid. Because if you don't take care of these needs down here, it's no good. And this is just basic architecture. It's basic construction. If I'm building a pyramid and my base is weak, can't build on it. And if I try to build on it, it's going to collapse. All right. So I got to take care of these needs before I get to those, before I get to those, before I get to those, before I get to those. And so Maslow basically broke them down as busy, uh, fundamental needs, things that I kind of are necess necessities and I got to have them. And then he came into what we call psychological needs, where it's my belonging and my self esteem. And then it reached self actualization, which is becoming a better human. So let's take them one by one. So let's start with the physiological. So this is the base of my pyramid, what I have to have. These are non-negotiable. If I do not have these, I die. I have to breathe. I have to eat. I have to drink. Again, sex, you can, whatever. Sleep, homeostasis, going to the bathroom. I got to go to the bathroom. I mean, you could come up to me if I've really got to go and stuff's percolating inside of me. I got to go. So... I can't listen to your story about what your puppy did last week. And even though maybe I want to hear it, I have no time. I got to go because I'm, I'm sweating. You know, if somebody's strangling me and I can't get my next breath out, I don't care whether or not I, you know, are you going to fail the exam this week? If I don't breathe again, I'm never taking the exam. So I have to have these things taken care of. These are non-negotiables. Without these, I don't survive. Physiological needs. Then we get to safety needs. These are things that I don't necessarily have to have, but I would like to have. These would be good to have. Security of the body. I would like to not be punched in the face every day. Now, could I still survive if I were punched in the face? Yes, I could, but I'd prefer not to. I'd like to have a job. Could I still have a life and be unemployed? Of course. I would like to have a home, but could I still be homeless and survive? Yes, I could. These are things that I would like to have. They're good to have. They're going to make my life better if I do. Non-negotiable, physiological, non-negotiable, must have them. Safety needs, I would like to have these. These would be good. These would make my life a whole lot easier. All right? And again, we're talking about your physical safety. You're not getting punched in the face. You have a roof over your head so that you're able to get the sleep. You have a job and resources so you're able to get the food. You know, the, these are taking care of those. But these, I have to have. Physiological, I have to have. And then we get to what are called psychological needs. So this isn't for the physical need, this is for the psychological need. So this is where we start to get to social needs, uh, friendship, family, sexual intimacy. And again, we get rid of the word sexual, just intimacy. You know, where you know someone as well as they know you. Having friends that you can trust, family you can depend on, love, belonging. And that starts to be a little bit more necessary. And then once I get that, and I have confidence in my my friends and my family, then I can start to build my self-esteem, you know, because I'm important to these people. I'm rewarded by these people. I'm recognized by these people. I'm given achievements by these people. You know, they recognize my importance in their life. I can respect other people. I can be respected by other people. So these start to become esteem needs, and these become very, very important to allow us to move forward and to sort of have that confidence in our friendships have that confidence in my family because I see them recognizing me and therefore it's building my self-esteem. Then once I have self-esteem and once I feel confident in myself, I can reach what is called self-actualization. And once I hit self-actualization, this is when I become a more moral person. This is when I become a more sacrificing person. I'll do things for others. I can become a more creative person. 
because I know that when I create more times than not, it's going to fail. A creative person, they're going to fail more times than they're going to be successful. I can be spontaneous. Let's try something new because if I fail, it's no big deal. Let's solve problems. Let's have a lack of prejudice. You know, there's no reason to be racist uh, because, you know, you, you're not, you don't feel threatened by anybody because you are confident within yourself to accept facts, to accept the fact that you could be wrong about something. And it's okay to be wrong. You don't have to be defensive. You don't have to explain every little thing you did. It's okay to say you have faults. All of this is self-actualization. Now, critics would argue that these levels do not have to necessarily go in order. And they would also argue that the levels are kind of silly because if we go back here and we look at the whole pyramid, and if I'm up here at self-actualization, as I suddenly got to go to the bathroom, I got to work my way back up the pyramid. You know, if suddenly I've got the self-esteem going on, but then people's punching me in the face, uh, do, do I necessarily lose my self-esteem for being punched in the face? Uh, do I got to build this back up and get in touch with my family and friends? Do you really like me? And go back up to self-esteem. That becomes tricky. And then what also becomes tricky is do I have a pyramid like a pyramid for work and a pyramid for my personal life and a pyramid for my professional life and a pyramid for uh, my family life? You know, do I have different pyramids? But again, it's an idea. It's a theory that some people believe in and other people, eh, not so much. So this is a little bit on Maslow and Maslow's self-actualization. If you'd like a little bit more of an explanation on it, it's right there. A little bit more on his higher IQ needs and some more things about uh, self-actualization. And again, creativity, because you're going to fail. More often than you're going to be successful, you are going to fail. All right. So that should wrap up Unit 1, Lecture 6 for On Level Psychology and Unit 4, Lecture 8 for AP Dual Credit. Uh, the next one on motivation, we're going to talk about motivation and hunger and locus of control and things such as that.